I'm Cynthia Rowland, and this is Episode 64 of EO Radio Show. In today's episode, I continue the discussion of the new proposed regulations issued recently by the IRS and Treasury. And these regulations provide a roadmap to several important exceptions for certain types of funds managed by sponsoring organizations that would otherwise be defined as donor-advised funds. These types of funds are important to philanthropy and don't have the characteristics that merit the strict DAF rules and excise taxes. The Internal Revenue Service and Treasury Department issued a notice of proposed rulemaking on Monday, November 13, which were officially published in the Federal Register on Tuesday, November 14, 2023, kicking off a 60-day comment period. While these proposed regulations won't be effective for some time, nevertheless, they are important planning tools for the sector. These proposed regulations provide guidance regarding donor-advised funds in general and the taxable distribution rules that apply to them. There are five subparts to these new proposed regs. They're issued under Treasury Regs numbered 53.4966-1 through 53.4966-5. In Episode 62, I provided an introduction to the basic rules that apply to sponsoring organizations and donor-advised funds. Episode 63 focused on the important definitions in the new reg 53.4966-1 and 4966-3. Today, we focus just on the exceptions to the definition of a DAF, and in one final episode in this series, I'll go into the details of the proposed rules that describe when the distributions from DAFs are subject to the tax on taxable distributions. Welcome to the EO Radio Show, your nonprofit legal resource. Brought to you by the Exempt Organizations Group at Ferella Braun and Martell. My name is Cynthia Rowland, and I'm a partner at Ferella. I'm a business and tax lawyer with more than 30 years of experience advising clients on nonprofit and charity law. Through this podcast, our lawyers and guests will discuss a range of legal and business issues impacting the nonprofit world because we understand you work hard every day to make your community a better place to live and do business. Many of our programs focus on the basics, and at times we'll do a deep dive into narrow and complicated legal issues. Again, welcome to the EO Radio Show. We're glad you're here. In today's episode, we're going to cover the new proposed regulation 53.4966-4. I'll have links in the show notes to the text of the proposed regulations. By way of overview, there are five subsections, 4966-1, which details the definitions that are relevant to defining a donor-advised fund. 4966-2 goes into some detail on the calculation of the actual excise taxes that would be paid on a taxable distribution under these rules. 4966-3 provides a lot of flavor on what is defined as a donor-advised fund. And 4966-4 goes into the exceptions to the definition of donor-advised funds and covers the statutory exceptions and two new rules under the regulatory authority provided in the code. And then finally, 4966-5 provides some new information on when a distribution from a donor-advised fund is actually treated as a taxable distribution from the fund. So by way of background, a donor-advised fund, which is subject to these onerous taxes on taxable distribution, is generally defined as a fund or account that is separately identified by reference to contributions of a donor or donors, that is owned and controlled by a sponsoring organization, and with respect to which a donor or any person appointed or designated by the donor, which is referred to as a donor advisor, has or reasonably expects to have advisory privileges with respect to the distribution or investments of amounts held in the fund by reason of the donor's status as a donor. So today's focus is on the exceptions to that donor advised fund definition. We're going to focus today on a fund that would otherwise meet those three criteria I just mentioned, but if they fit within these specific exceptions in 4966-4, they will not be treated as a donor advised fund and will escape this regulatory regime. So here's the overview. The proposed regulations generally would provide that a, that a DAF does not include any fund that makes distributions only to a single identified organization or certain grants to individuals for travel, study, or other similar purposes. So those are two exceptions that we'll talk about. In addition to those two initial exceptions, The Secretary has discretionary authority, that is the Secretary of Treasury, has the authority to exempt a fund or account from the definition of DAF if the fund is advised by a committee not directly or indirectly controlled by the donor, donor advisor, and their related parties, or if the fund or account benefits a single identified charitable purpose. 
The proposed regulations provide two exceptions to the definition of DAF under this discretionary authority. One is a detailed exception for disaster relief funds, which is consistent with a notice issued in 2006 that provided some rules for disaster relief funds. And then these proposed regs also include an exception for certain scholarship funds whose committee is nominated by a Section 501c4 organization with a broad-based membership. So starting with the single identified organization exception. The proposed regs provide that a funder account is not considered a DAF if it meets the following criteria, along with meeting all the other requirements discussed in the proposed regs. First, this single identified organization exception applies to a fund that is established to make and actually does make distributions solely to a single identified organization that is either an organization described in sections 170C2 and 509A1, 2, or 3, other than disqualified supporting organizations, or a governmental entity described in 170 if the distribution is made exclusively for public purposes. So we'll go into a little more detail on both of these. So the rules for single identified organization are very specific that the exception does not apply if the single identified organization is a private foundation, certain types of disqualified supporting organization, a foreign organization, or any non-charitable organization. So that's what the list of code sections was getting at. The single identified organization has to be a public charity. It can't be the type of public charity that achieves that status as a supporting organization. And there's particular rules on what type of supporting organization is disqualified for that purpose. The proposed regs also provide that if the single identified organization loses its exempt status or ceases operating, the sponsoring organization can plan around that and the fund doesn't lose its status. So this is important for planning purposes when setting up a single identified organization fund or account at a sponsoring organization. You can set it up with the provision that the sponsoring organization is permitted to substitute another single identified organization if the substitution is conditioned on the occurrence of the loss of exemption, substantial failure or abandonment of operations by that single identified organization or the dissolution or reorganization that results in the single identified organization ceasing to exist, but only if that event is beyond the direct or indirect control of the donor, donor advisors, or related persons. So that's important for planning purposes. We could identify in our original setup for the fund a single organization to receive distributions, and that setup can include a fail-safe mechanism if that single organization ceases to exist. So to wrap up this little exception, the key takeaway is that the single identified organization has to be a public charity. Governmental organizations can also be the single identified beneficiary of a single entity fund. So keep that in mind. There's really two options, a public charity or a governmental organization. So a couple of additional things to keep in mind for our single identified organization setup. Under the proposed regulations, the sponsoring organization would be permitted to make distributions to the single organization for its activities, but only the activities other than administering DAFs or grant making from that single fund. However, the sponsoring organization cannot make distributions directly to third parties on behalf of the single identified organization, such as making distributions to third parties for goods or services or incidental grant making, because the statute basically requires that the fund or account to qualify under this single identified organization rule requires that the distributions from our fund must be made only to the single identified organization. There are some anti-abuse provisions in here for the single identified organization. The proposed regs provide that a funder account is not treated as fitting within this exception if a donor, donor advisor, or related person to that fund has or reasonably expects to have the ability to advise regarding distributions from that grantee single identified organization's. So that's a pretty obvious anti-abuse rule that catches using the single organization as a pass-through that actually is responsive to the original donor. And a second anti-abuse rule is that a distribution from the funder account that provides a directly or indirectly a more than incidental benefit to the donor, donor advisor, or related person is prohibited. So, for example, if the donor establishes a fund to make distributions only to a single public charity and the donor is on the board of that public charity, then the fund would not be able to meet this exception because the donor has the ability under that scenario to advise some or all the distributions from the public charity to other entities. 
So the preamble to the Treasury regs notes that Treasury recognizes that a sponsoring organization may not have direct knowledge regarding the activities of the donor or donor advisor or related party with regard to the single identified organization. But the proposed regs allow the sponsoring org to rely on a certificate from the donor that the donor, him or herself, and no donor advisor or related person has or reasonably expects to have the ability to advise regarding distributions from that single identified organization to other individuals or entities. And the sponsoring organization also needs to require that the donor make a representation that no distribution from the funder account will provide directly or indirectly a more than incidental benefit to the donor. These are very similar representations to what we have now, to what we see now for distributions from DAFs when they're advised by the donor. So moving on to another exception, the statutory scholarship exception to the definition of a donor advised fund. So consistent with the statute, the proposed regs provide that under this exception from the definition of a DAF, a donor or donor advisor may provide advice as to which individuals receive grants for travel, study, or other similar purposes from a fund or account at a sponsoring organization if the following four conditions are met. The four criteria are as follows. The statutory fund is excluded as a DAF if it meets these criteria. Number one, the person provides the advice exclusively in the person's capacity as a member of the selection committee. The person here in this rule, meaning the donor, donor advisor, or related party. The criteria number two for an accepted scholarship fund is that all the members of the selection committee are appointed by the sponsoring organization. Condition number three is that no combination of donors, donor advisors, or related persons controls directly or indirectly the committee. So the committee has to be independent of donor, donor advisor, and related persons. And criteria number four, all grants from the fund or account are awarded on an objective and non-discriminatory basis pursuant to a written procedure pre-approved in advance by the board of directors of the sponsoring organization. And that procedure is designed to ensure that all grants meet the requirements of the statutory rules for scholarship funds from private foundations. So this will sound very familiar to planners who work with private foundation-sponsored scholarship programs. The requirements in the regulations under those private foundation rules include the requirement that the group from which the grantees are selected ordinarily needs to be sufficiently large to constitute a charitable class. And the members of the selection committee must not be in a position to derive a private benefit if certain potential grantees are selected over others. Finally, the sponsoring organization has to maintain adequate records regarding the identification and selection of the individual grantees. So if the fund or account satisfies the requirements of this exception, the sponsoring organization may award a scholarship from the fund or account to an individual without subjecting the sponsoring organization or its fund managers to the taxes under 4966. So again, this is very similar to the private foundation rules with the caveat that under the private foundation rules, the foundation has to get a pre-approval from the IRS of the grant procedures. Here, in this exception, the pre-approval comes from the board of the sponsoring organization, and it doesn't require an IRS request. The proposed regs go into some detail about when the combination of donor, donor advisor, and related persons is treated as controlling directly or indirectly the selection committee. The regs provide that direct control would exist if the donor, donor advisor, or related persons, either alone or together, can require the committee to take or refrain from taking an action, control 50% or more of the total voting power of the committee, or have the right to exercise veto power over the committee's decision. Whether indirect control exists is determined under the facts and circumstances, and some of the facts and circumstances that are considered are the nature of the relationships among the members of the selection committee with any donor, donor advisor, or related person. For example, the proposed regs mention a committee would be indirectly controlled by a combination of donor, donor advisor, and related persons if a majority of the selection committee is currently engaged by the donor, donor advisor, or related person in an employment or fiduciary capacity, whether as an employee or independent contractor, or they're recommended by the donor or donor advisor and appointed to the selection committee based on other than objective criteria regarding the person's expertise or a combination thereof. So what that captures is you can't set up the committee and expect it to be respected as independent if the members of the committee are less than a majority as the donor, donor advisor, and related persons, but the other people are also related to the donor, such as the donor's legal counsel, the donor's accountant, other professionals in their orbit with whom they have a close working relationship. So that was editorializing by me, but you get the idea. 
So moving on, the next exception I want to talk about is the exception for scholarship funds established by certain 501c4 organization. Now, I note at the outset that it's possible this exception might be extended to C5 and C6, that's trade associations and labor organizations. Right now, it's limited to C4, which is basically the social welfare organizations most commonly thought of as lobbying entities, all three of these categories, C4, C5, and C6. These are important exempt entities, but the contributions to them are not deductible as charitable contributions. But nevertheless, the proposed regs provide this very helpful exception for certain scholarship funds established by the C4 organizations. These proposed regs provide this exception to the definition of DAF for funds established by a broad-based membership organization if six conditions are met. These conditions substantially mirror the conditions on the the statutory scholarship exception I just talked about, except that the donors may control the committee. So here are the six criteria. First, the fund's single identified charitable purpose must be limited to making grants to individuals for scholarships that are described under the rules for the private foundations. Second, the selection of recipients of the scholarships from the fund must be made by a selection committee, the members of which are nominated by the C4 organization and approved in writing by the sponsoring organization. This requirement allows the C4 to have input on the members of the selection committee, but leaves the final decision to the sponsoring organization. Third criteria for this exception is that the fund or account must be large enough to serve a charitable class. Now, for the rules on a charitable class, there are earlier episodes in the series, and I'll link to that in the show notes. I have an episode that talks about the distinction between a charitable class and a benefit to particular individuals. So the fourth criteria here is that, like the statutory scholarship exception, recipients of grants from the fund or account must be selected on an objective and non-discriminatory basis pursuant to a written procedure approved in advance by the sponsoring organization's board of directors and which is designed to ensure that all the grants meet the requirements of the private foundation rules and the regs thereunder. Fifth criteria here is that no distribution may be made from the fund or account to any director, officer, or trustee of the sponsoring organization of the fund, any member of the fund selection committee, any member, honorary member, or employee of the C4 organization, or any person related to anyone described in those previous three categories. Finally, and this should sound familiar to people who set up scholarship funds, the funder account that satisfies this exception has to maintain adequate records that demonstrate the recipients were selected, in fact, on an objective and non-discriminatory basis. So that's the general overview of the new exception for certain scholarship funds established by C4 organizations. Moving on to the disaster relief exception in the proposed regulations. These proposed regs provide that both an employer-sponsored disaster relief fund and a disaster relief fund outside of the employment context are not treated as donor-advised funds as long as the requirements of Section 139 of the Internal Revenue Code are met. 139 is a standard provision that applies to disaster relief. To meet the disaster relief exception in the proposed regs, there are six conditions. These conditions basically mirror the provisions in the 2006 notice. So here is a rundown of those conditions. First, the disaster fund single charitable purpose must be to provide relief from one or more qualified disasters within the meaning of 139. So that's not just any disaster. It has to be a disaster that is recognized as a disaster by an independent governmental pronouncement. The episodes of the EO radio show that address disaster relief are episodes 9 and 10 on disaster relief generally and the meaning of a charitable class. Second, the funder account must serve a charitable class. Third, the recipients of grants from the funder account must be made by a selection committee not controlled by the donors, donor advisors, or related persons, and for which all the members are appointed by the sponsoring organization. As an alternative, the proposed regs provide that if the funder account gives preference or priority to employees or their family members of a particular employer to receive the grants, The majority of the selection committee must consist of persons who are not in a position to exercise substantial influence over the affairs of the employer entity, or there have to be adequate substitute procedures to ensure that any benefit to the employer is incidental and tenuous. Fourth, the selection committee must select grant recipients based on objective and non-discriminatory determinations of need based on the written procedure approved in advance by the board of directors. Fifth, no distribution from the funder account may result in more than an incidental benefit to any director, officer, or trustee of the sponsoring organization 
any member of the fund selection committee or any member, any person related to a director, officer, or trustee of the sponsoring organization or the selection committee. And finally, again, this will sound very familiar. The sponsoring organization must maintain records that demonstrate the need of the recipients for the disaster relief assistance provided. So there's got to be demonstrable need. The sponsoring organization records also have to be sufficient for the public charity to include on its 990 form the information that is generally required for disaster relief activities. So that applies to all disaster relief, not just funds established with a sponsoring organization. So I think that covers a new proposed reg 53.4966-4 pretty well. That's all for this episode. Stay tuned for the final episode that dives deeper into what the big deal is all about, and that is the excise taxes that can apply if the sponsoring organization gets the setup wrong. So in the next episode, we'll cover those details. What is a taxable distribution and what is the amount of the penalty taxes? I'm Cynthia Rowland, and you've been listening to EO Radio Show, your nonprofit legal resource brought to you by the Exempt Organizations Group at Ferrella Braun and Martel. Ferrella also now has several YouTube playlists that organize the podcast episodes by interest area, so be sure to look there for episodes applicable to your interest in the legal world of nonprofits. As always, if you have suggestions for topics you would like for us to discuss, please email us at eoradioshow at fbm.com. That's eoradioshow at fbm.com. Thank you for joining me. Until next time, make a difference. 